It says it's recording. Cool. Okay, so today I want to go through um, and give an introduction to some of the work that we've been completing over the last couple of years uh, in terms of providing some sort of language and an associated logic for reasoning about behaviors that happen over time. Uh, so in particular, I want to give an introduction to relationships between categories and logic. Um, so the endpoint that, that David gets from his work, although we won't see all of it today, is to be able to write down statements, uh, say you're, so you're reasoning about um, some sort of plane and you want some sort of guarantee on, um, on whether if if the plane is telling you something bad is going to happen, that you uh, change your course soon enough. So you might have some relationship uh, that you want to have between two things, let's call them the dials that you read, and then the thrusters that fire to, to change your course. And so we want to understand this sort of object as something you can compose to, or, or decompose to, to specify uh, what you want, and then to construct something that obeys what you want. Um, so I want this particular thing to represent, or, or to specify some sort of logical statement like, uh, for all uh, times t, um, if, um, so if at time t we see something like the, the dials are in this sort of thing, this object would define called bad position, so if they're telling something bad is going to happen, then um, there exists some, so within one second, so there exists some um, R in R of type reals such that, um, uh, that's right, such that 0 exists more than 1, so it's it happens soon enough, um, such that at some time uh, t plus r, so within r of, of this time t, uh, we have some state of the thrusters. So thrusters equals, let's just call it on. So the idea is to try and find a category where, where this sort of thing lives. Uh, and so we might have some sort of system that, uh, so we have some dials, uh, and so this is um, the pilot sort of reads the dials, and then uh, outputs some sort of control, and then these controls through sort of the, some sort of engine system activate the thrusters. All right, so you might have be able to specify the behavior of these two things and then construct some sort of composite behavior and you want some way of saying that this thing is going to be equal to, to this thing. But the question is, we've used a whole lot of logical stuff here um, that is sort of, uh, I, mean, I mean this is I guess not defined for you at the moment but it's suggestive of things we actually use to reason. And so we want that sort of reasoning structure to be understood within the category so we can actually sort of write down not only what these two things are, but that one implies another um, in talking within the, the language of the category. So for this, we're going to begin with a careful study of the category of, of sets, um, because that's sort of the, the setting which we normally interpret logic. And the aim will be to, to try and generalize that setting so we can discuss, uh, in particular, logic with truth values that are not just yes this is true or no this is not true but yes this is true over this sort of time interval um, and so we can in particular reason about these behavioral things that happen over time okay so um, let's call this logic uh, in category so, let me just start by telling you some properties that the category set has. And the reason 
I want to tell you about these properties is that we'll, we'll next see that these properties are useful for understanding logic in the category set, and then we will use those, uh, those, those properties as a sort of guiding principles for what a topo should be. Um, so, one property is that, uh, so, let's see, properties or structures available in a set. Uh, so set is category where I guess I should remind you maybe that the objects are finite set, uh, the objects are all sets, and the morphisms are functions. Um, set has one uh, limits and co-limits. Um, so we spoke a lot about co-limits last time, and remember that these are things like uh, the empty set or initial object. Sorry, empty set. Um, which is always defined using this universal property called initial, initiality. Um, and it has disjoint unions. These are co-products. Um, and it had these things called push-outs, which were sort of a bit like disjoint unions, but they weren't disjoint. Uh, <laughs> so let me tell you a bit about limits, uh, which is going to sort of formally, in the universal perspective, be dual to all of the stuff, but because that is, I, did, it, um, I won't give you the sort of formal definitions, I just will tell you what these objects are. So dual to the empty set is, or an initial object is called a terminal object. Um, and the terminal objects in this category are just anything, I've got to write it one, um, and it's anything with one set. So in fact, that the universal property is that there's a unique, given any other set, there's a unique function to this set. Um, what does that function do? Well, we take everything in this other set X and map it to this unique element of this one element set one. Yes? Uh, in the category set, uh, is there just one object which uh, is the set of one element? Is they yeah. all equivalent to each other? Or is to each right, other? they're all isomorphic to each other. So there's a bijection between any two elements okay. of one. But you element. do make it. Yes. Okay. We do, but uh, linguistically we're kind of lazy, especially when we refer to a find universal property. Mm -hmm. So we'll often say the one element set um, as opposed to a one element set. <laughs> but we can pretend we've picked one. Um, so the universal property, and in particular this uniqueness of the unique isomorphism, means that it really doesn't matter. If you pick a different one element set, we can translate between... Are you um, using the actual choice set? No, no, no. It's just, <laughs> it's just the universal property. Um, okay. Uh, so, that's analog set. Uh, we also have products, uh, or Cartesian products. So, um, in particular, if we have uh, sets X and Y, we can form this set x times y, um, which is just equal to the pairs. And we've written this down a lot, but never really formally spelled this out. So it's equal to the pairs of where one, the first thing is an element of x, and the second thing is an element of y. Um, thirdly, uh, and this is important, especially for, for the sort of logic well, the operations I want to talk about today, uh, we have pullbacks. So what does this mean? This means, analogously, to push out, but in the opposite perspective, we might have some functions, uh, f and g, that have a common codomain. And so we construct a universal object here that is sort of the best thing that maps down to, to these two things such that this diagram commutes. Um, so, I won't go into the details, but I will give you the definition. Uh, the definition says that we have this object x times a, y over a, where x times y over a is equal to, well, I guess this is not a definition. We define it by the universal property, but we can compute that it's equal to the pairs x, y, such that f of x is equal to g of y um, as elements of a. Um, so let's get familiar with this by saying some exercise. Um, if I have some set a, b, c, let me do this like this. We have a, we have b, we have c, we have one on that 
two, and then we have, let's say, this set for the domains, and then I'm going to say that this one maps here, this one maps here, this one maps here. Okay, so I've given you three sets and two functions in this shape. Uh, I'll give you a few minutes to sort of digest this idea and tell me what the pullback is. Free to discuss, as usual. Okay, it sounds like people have got the idea, right? We have to solve this equation. So what are solutions to this equation? Um, well, there are 1 and A go to the same thing, 1 and B go to the same thing, and 2 and C go to the same thing. Um, and that's, that's the pullback. So another name for this sort of thing is fibered product. Um, so we can think of it as a product over each of these things. So we get the pre-image of this element in there and there and take the product and then take the union, disjoint union of that with the, the same thing for this point and, and so on. Question? Yes. What is A? What is big, A? What is big A? Uh, sorry. Big A? Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, I've used notation. <laughs> but I, I was saying, oh, I was sort of writing this as an analogy between this diagram and that. So I'm going to call this set X, this set Y, and that, uh, sorry, this set A and that set Y. Um, if you prefer, I'm just going to write, I'm just write, pullback of this equals that. Okay, so um, we'll see that pullbacks are very important in a second, but let me give you some more important properties of the category set. Um, we saw this last time, but set has empty model factorizations. What does this mean again? It means that um, given f x to y, we can, de we can factorize it into an epi, which I'm going to write like this from x onto its image. So by epi, I mean subjective. And this in image includes into the set y. So this is what I'm going to write for my So I might call this e and f. Um, so we want these to exist. And in particular, we want these to exist because um, mono, it means mono is a very nicely behaved. Uh, and um, when mono is a very nicely behaved, we can think of them as defining some generalization of subsets. So here, an equivalence class of monos um, is, is just the subsets of the uh, object, say, y. Um, and as I'll argue in a moment, subsets are very important to just standard notions of in logic. Um, so three, I want to, this is important for quantification, which I won't talk much about further, but it's important to know that every sort of topos, and in particular set, has um, what are called internal forms. Um, I mention this because we've seen this idea before in the context of closed monoidal categories, uh, which were important for enrichment. So what this means is that there is some sort of a junction between um, times the, the Cartesian product, or just the product, and some other thing which we call the exponential object, or an exponential object. So what this is saying is that morphisms with two variables, a and b, to c, can be thought of as, as morphisms functions from a, giving, then giving you a function from b to c. So, in particular, uh, an explicit definition of c to the b is functions, this is the set of functions f 
um, B to C. Is that sort of like B copies of C as an index set, sort of? So we use this notation because um, if you consider these as finite sets, so say we have this being a five element set and this being a seven element set, then the number of functions from a seven element set to a five element set is precisely five to the seven. Um, and you can think about that as being able to make five choices seven times. So it's five times five times five, and so on. Uh, so that's. That's the reason for the notation, um, but, the, the, but the definition is just this, it's the set of functions. Um, but what, what we see is precisely this correspondence, and this allows us to, to talk about quantification. So if we want to reason about, if we have two variables and we want to talk about something where, which happens for or B, then now it's, it's going to be some thing defined on A. So we need to find a way from shifting B to something that's a variable to something that's um, in, in the sort of semantic structure of logic. I don't understand your notation here. Set up with parentheses and the uh, arguments. So, so remember, in a category C with objects A and B, this is the Hom set. Oh, okay. Thank of, Thank so you. the set of morphisms okay. from X to Y. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes. Sorry, I should have reminded everyone of that. It's been a rather quick course. <laughs> um, okay. <coughs> So I'm going to give you one more property, and this is that C has sub-object classifiers. Um, and this is perhaps the most important thing for at least logic and the generality that we want to talk about today. So uh, first definition, um, a sub-object of um, x in set is really just a subset, but is an equivalence class of one morphisms. So this is the generation, gen, a definition that generalizes subset uh, from, let's call it A into X. So what does equivalence class mean? It means that if I have some other subset of X, then I want a bijection between these two things. So basically, I can just rename everything if I like, but it's still really the same subset once we look at it. So it's image in, in X. What is A here? A is any set. Um, so this is a set A, and this thing having an injection from A into X says that we may as well think of A as a subset of X. So we always mm -hmm. denote the monomorphisms, the little thing okay. in the arrow? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, And I'll leave that up. Uh, okay, did I run it? Yeah, okay. What I want to do is now define a sub object classifier now that we know what a sub object is. So, yes. Sub object classifier in some category. Uh, sorry, let's say a sub object of X in any category, um, and a sub object classifier in any category um, is an object uh, which we're going to call Omega and a map morphism um, one to omega. So let me say that by one here, so x uh, a C has terminal object one, which we're going to call one. So remember, a terminal a terminal object is an object such that every other object has a unique map to it. Um, in one place that Roland set. So I'm just going to call a terminal object in any category. Well, if C has a terminal object, then I'm going to call that terminal object one. And a sub-object classifier is another object together with a morphism from one to that object, which we're going to call true, um, such that if we have a sub-object, okay, such that 
for all sub objects. Um, so a of x, a sitting inside x. Um, we'll call this M, then there exists some map from X to the sub object classifier such that this so is a pullback square. So this is the notation for pullback square. And what is this square? Well, this map is the map true coming from the sub object classifier. This is the sub object classifier object itself. Um, this here is the sub object of x. We can only have a unique map to the terminal object, um, so we don't really need to talk about what that is. And this here is the, this map here, which we call m is for the classifier. Those uh, ceiling brackets around. No, they just that's just notation. Um, so I could have picked anything. I could have put m tilde, m, uh, and uh, m prime, whatever. I just that's the name that David picked in the notes. So I'm sticking to it. Um, I assume it's standard somewhere. Okay, so why do we care about this definition? Um, Let me set another quick exercise. Um, well, okay. I guess an important fact, since I said set has the structure of having a sub object classifier, what is the sub sub object classifier in set? The sub object classifier. Set is what he calls true false. So it's in fact any two element set, um, but I've called it like this because the map, there's going to be a map from 1 to omega for true, um, and it sort of justifies this abuse of notation. So what this map is going to do is there's a unique element up here, and it's going to map it to one of the elements of here, and which one it's going to map to it's going to map it to true, otherwise that would be terrible notation. Um, okay, so what, what does it mean, in what sense does this classify sub-objects? Well, uh, the intuition up here was that a sub-object is just a subset. Um, so, and the point being is that, uh, for example, um, Let's say that we're looking at sub-objects of the natural numbers. So we'll, um, so we'll take E to be a set of even numbers. E equals this is a subset of natural numbers. So we should be able to find a morphism from N to omega that classifies this, this subset. So exercise. Um, we have E included into N, and we have, so I guess we'll call this little e, um, and we have most of this diagram because we have a unique map here, and then we have this other object classifier here. What is this map? called the classifier of the subset. Modulo 2. Mod yeah. Mod e to 0. Right. Does everyone, does everyone happy with that? Two so, yeah. <laughs> so e of some natural number n is equal to true if n is even and false otherwise. So then, uh, 
why is this true? We need to check that this is the pullback, or this is a pullback, right? So, do people want a minute and a half to discuss why this is a pullback? Sure. Does it have to be a pullback and not just a commutative square? Why does it have to be a pullback? Because that's how we define it. So we'll <laughs> right, but why, 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 and not, we... why not just a commutative square? Um, so I could take, say, two copies of the even numbers. I could, I could take, so I could take the map n numbers. times n to n that maps. Uh, the parent. Well, that maps n times n to like 2n plus 2m or something like that. And that would be, that would make this diagram commute because the image would be the even number. Like if we take any element here, it goes to true. If we take any element here, it goes to an even number and the even numbers go to true. So it commutes, but that's, that's not quite what we want because that something is not a subobject. Mm -hmm. okay. or, or even worse, I guess, we could take the one element set here and map that to that, and map that to the element zero, or something. And so that would map to true by both things, so it would commute. But somehow, that thing is not the subobject corresponding to this mapped evenness. So what this notion of subobject classification does is, for every subobject of of this thing, we get a map here, and for every map to, to the subobject classifier, we get a subobject, and this is a one to one correspondence. Whereas if it didn't have to be a pullback, it, it wouldn't be a one to one correspondence. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, let me. So we call a morphism um, from some set X to the sub classifier a predicate. Um, and this is sort of, if we think of these, well, what will, in, in this category set, what will this thing do? Well, um, this, it's going to take every element set of x and map it to either true or false. And so if we take the subset of things that are true, then that defines a subset of this. And we can kind of think of this um, as sort of the basic structure that we can reason with, with in logic. Um, somehow a prop, the meaning of a proposition is ultimately just the set on things of which it's true. Um, so, so we have some a predicate. So we have some predicate. This here is sort of the predicate n is even. Um, and what we can do with a sub-object classifier is go from that predicate as a function to, to sort of its semantics as, as a subset of the places where it's true. Um, but I want to give you a... Uh, let's go straight onto the logic then. Um, so... So what we have is we're working in some category set where we have all these structures that, that seem quite nice. Um, and we have these things called subobjects, which are sub subsets in the setting, and a sort of sort of hand way to say that we can think of these things as, as predicates in some way. So but what we want to do is actually start reasoning about these things. So we want to talk about things like, is this true or this is true? Or is can, can what what does it mean to form the set sort of or the predicate? A and B, right, or A implies B. Um, and so the story is that we can do all the things we normally do in set uh, using these four structures. Um, and that means that in any category, 
with these four structures, we can talk about some analog of this sort of logic, which we might call intuitionistic logic. Um, and, that, and that means we can do logic in that category. It has a slightly different meaning, uh, but the basic, uh, probably should, uh, the basic intuitions, no pun intended, should imply, uh, should, uh, should apply. So, um, so let's say logic in, uh, very, very logical operations. So how can we construct the idea of and using this stuff? Well, there's uh, let's see. So we can construct. So what what should and be? Well. It should be this thing, ultimately, that represents this truth table that says true and true is true, true and false is false, and so on. Um, so I want to get a map uh, from, from pairs of things in our sub-object classifier, because this is where true and false live, just to the sub-object classifier itself. Uh, and the way we can get that map is by first constructing it is by using this map true and the properties of products. So there is a map from 1 to omega times omega, uh, which I'm going to call true, true. Um, and we get this map from the universal property of the product. So you're familiar with it in set because we can just always form pairs so, uh, in, in some product set. Uh, but in particular, if we have a map from 1 to, to A and 1 to B, the property of the product says we can get a map from 1 to A times B. So we have a map true and true, and we can get a map sort of true, the pair true true from 1 to omega times omega. But that's not quite what, so this sort of expresses uh, andness in some way, but we want still a map from omega times omega to omega. So how do we do this? Well, it turns out that this is the sub-object of this, and we can just use the universal property of the sub-object 